For this demo, we will be making a virtual reality gallery in which you can exhibit artwork. These galleries will be created in the form of a stereo 360 VR panorama, which can be shared on platforms such as YouTube and viewed in active 3D um, on any mobile device with or without 3D goggles. Here you've seen we've switched from a stereo to a now mono view. This is all just screen capture from looking at this through a phone, so I apologize if the hands are a little shaky. Um, a 3D VR panoramic image is essentially a picture like this. That is, we have our space stretched out with a kind of spherical distortion that creates that wave pattern that goes throughout. And these two images are then projected onto a virtual sphere, um, which by moving your phone or um, if you're using an Oculus or something, VR headset, um, the accelerometer um, and cameras sense your movement and you can look around the space like you're really there. And here's a view of how this space looks in Blender, which is the software in which we're going to create this. Um, so you can see that unlike a real art gallery, um, we can see our pictures on the outside of this room, which has seven sides, which is also unusual. Um, another thing you might notice is unlike a real gallery, this room has no doors or windows. Um, this room does actually have a ceiling. I just am not showing it right now in, um, in Blender. I have that object hidden. Um, these objects we see floating above in circles are our light sources, which you can see reflected on the ground. Though for um, this demo, the gallery we'll be making only will have one light source. So a little bit about the choices made here. Um, because we are only going to be viewing this image, essentially as if we were standing in this point, um, I haven't bothered to do anything with the outside space, which is why the images are seen from the outside of the space as well. Though I don't think that would be a bad idea if you could really do that in a gallery. Um, the reason we have no doors is the same reason that I've chosen to use a seven-sided space, though we'll be doing a five-sided space in our demonstration. Um, essentially, a VR panoramic image gives you imp the impression of being able to stand in the middle of a scene and rotate around and look up and down within that scene. For that reason, actually, the more sides you have in the scene, the better, um, because the more like a cylinder your scene is, the less distortion you will have. A gallery space like this which, you know, we have, it's a little bit long and skinny, but it's a little bit more like a conventional gallery. We've got more than one picture on a wall. Our shape is rectangular, and we even have a doorway leading into it. Um, a space like this could lend itself well um, to um, an animation like we see here, or even to a more immersive form of VR, um, but in the case of an actual VR panorama, which is the easiest type of VR experience to share online because all you need is um, as little as YouTube and a smartphone to be able to move through the space physically, um, in order to create something like that, we're limited um, in terms of our movement in the space to essentially standing in the middle of the room and looking around in a circle. So because we can't move left or right in this space, um, essentially our view of these images that are off center from us would be somewhat obscured. Um, there are ways to um, get past this problem by using multiple panoramas and creating a sort of virtual tour where you can look and click on certain areas, but we're not gonna get into that level of sophistication. So this long space you can see when converted into a 3D panorama, um, it kind of just looks like a mess. Um, it's, you know, the distortion is quite extreme. Um, and when we think about the fact that this is ultimately a 2D image that's going to be projected into a 3D space, we realize that there's quite a bit of pixel information, even though I realize this is overexposed, on these two images that are close to us. But um, these images are small and skewed, and the image at the end of the room which is split in half, that's not a problem, is just absolutely tiny. 
Um, here in our seven-sided room, you can see that while we do see some distortion in the images, of course, um, they all get equal resolution. So that's a good reason to give everything a wall. Here is the five-sided gallery that we're going to make in this demo. And before we get started on that, um, I'm just going to go over a few really basic things to know for using Blender. Um, it may seem that I leave some things in this intro to Blender unco un uncovered. This, this is not um, an intro to all the basics of Blender. This is just the bare minimum of things to know to get into this tutorial within which you will learn more things. Um, to begin with, here is actually um, a somewhat intimidating list of all the different um, key commands, um, most of which um, will be um, needed in this. Not just key commands, but also I've labeled um, what a variety of these different tools and menus do that may be relevant. I will create a link so that you can download this, but you can also just screen grab this now so you could set your, brow your, um, your um, video window to full screen and then, you know, just um, make a screen grab in five, four, three, two, one. I hope you got it. Um, back here, um, we're back to our image. And I'm actually gonna start here with some of the basics of Blender. Um, right here, we have a layers menu, similar to something you would see in Photoshop. Um, all of our objects are in here, whether they're lights or meshes or cameras, etc. Um, we have eyes that we can turn on and off, um, which make elements um, visible or invisible. I'll turn the light on and off because you can really see a difference with that. Um, and we also have these little cameras next to items, which is an indicator of whether or not they will render. So this scene that we're going to build does have a ceiling on it. Now we can't see into the room anymore. Um, we can't see the ceiling, but when the room is rendered, um, from the camera, which is this shape located on the inside, um, because this camera is showing, um, that means that it will render. Um, another basic thing that's important to know is how to navigate in Blender. Now this demo is kind of unusual for Blender demos because it's on a Mac, which is um, usually not the preferred system for Blender, for reasons that I might mention um, later. I will say one advantage to using Blender on a Mac is the actual navigation is excellent in terms of how you can move through the space. So um, first off, this part is universal regardless of system. We are in our render view now. Um, whoops, this is a material view. This is a solid view. And this is a wired view. I'm gonna go back to this material view. Um, next to it, we have, this is um, X-ray mode, which we'll come back to later. This shows us different overlays um, and information we can add. Um, depending on the mode we're seeing in, we will address that when the time comes. Um, in order to navigate around the space, um, if you're using an external mouse on any computer, Mac, Linux, Windows, you just hold the middle click down and move the mouse around and it will rotate the scene. You can also click directly on this thing here and move the scene around like that. To um, pan around the scene, you hold down shift and the middle key on your external mouse and you can shift the scene around as opposed to rotate it. Now, if you're on a Mac, um, Blender has excellent support for the Magic Trackpad. So by simply scrolling side to side or up and down on the Apple Trackpad, I can very easily rotate the scene. And to zoom in and out, I can also just use the pinch zoom in and out feature, which is universal um, on Macs and um, iOS devices. Um, also, if I hold down the shift key, I can do the same movement. So I can slide two fingers around on the trackpad and everything moves quite fluidly. And personally, I prefer this even to using an external mouse, which I know is the general preference. Now back to this uh, navigator here, if I click on a given axis, it will just rotate the scene directly to that axis. Um, and notice um, that the scene does not look three-dimensional anymore. When you click on an axis, the scene switches to an orthographic projection rather than a perspective projection, which is how it would look if we were really standing in front of this shape. 
um, this button here, as you can see, switches us through those projections. Um, orthographic projection is useful because you can see exactly how things are scaled. Um, this um, hand shortcut is another way to pan around the scene. You click and hold that down and drag around, um, though I prefer to just hold down shift and pan by sliding around on the mouse. Um, to start your document, um, we just go to File, New, and we just want to create a general document. Now every document in Blender starts with a cube, a camera, and a light. Now I'm still navigating just by tracking around on the mouse. Um, up here we have control for snapping, this will be addressed later. Here we have different working environments for animation, UV editing, sculpting. We're going to mostly stay in layout for this whole demo here. These tabs um, address a variety of important palettes, which we will address as they become relevant um, in the demo. Um, here we have our basic tools. Um, though I pretty much have this set to the select tool the whole time. Um, to switch between object and edit mode, you press the tab key after selecting an object. Now this is important. In object mode, you can do basic things like resizing an object, but um, edit mode is really where you go if you want to um, create something new. Just like almost any other program, Command C, sorry, Command Z or Control Z will create undo. Now, something that is really important to know before we get into this demo, if you haven't used Blender before, because this is very different than under other programs, is most functions in Blender are adjusted simply by starting the um, action, we'll call it, and then moving the mouse or trackpad, but not dragging the mouse or trackpad. You know, you can think of if you're working with a brush, um, you generally push down the mouse on the left key and you move the brush across to create an action. Um, and you would expect that if I click on this point and drag it, I can pull it, but instead my selection just gets bigger. Um, so in order to drag a point around, which is a basic way to edit an image, I will press the G key, which is one of the um, really important key commands. Tab is really crucial, switching between edit and object mode. The G key allows us to move this point around. And if it's in a position I like, I can click the mouse and it will then engage and I've created this bizarre shape. And I've just done undo again. If I have the whole thing selected and I hold down G to grab, I can just move the whole object around. I can also use this feature to stretch an object by selecting just one side of it and using the, the object out. But the important thing to keep track of is you press G and you move the mouse around. Whoops. You press G and you move the mouse around and the object moves. Now, the movement of this object seems may seem kind of strange or even random. Um, it's not really moving on any axis. Um, typically, when you move or resize an object, it will move based on the virtual axes of the plane of your vision. If you want to move your object on a specific axis, you press G to grab, move your object around, and then if I press an axis, so X, I'm now moving this object only on the X axis, or Y, or I'm gonna press the letter Z. If I wanna move the object on two axes, I actually press Shift and the axis I don't want. So if I press Shift Z, now I can move this object on the plane of the X, Y axis. And these move actions work essentially the same in layout mode. I say essentially and the difference will be addressed later. Um, other just very basic things that you should know, um, S will allow you then to move the mouse. Again, we're not clicking and dragging, we're just moving the mouse around to resize the image. And this um, responds to the same axis logic as moving. So Z just up and down, X 
just side to side. Um, R will rotate. And again, we have this interesting rotation just based on the angle that we're looking at the scene. Um, but if we start rotating and then press Z, now the image is only rotating on this axis. Um, with all um, of these adjustments, I'm going to rotate this image, this object now. Um, you can press the axis twice to switch between the global and local axis. So here I'm going to rotate again, and I hit Z once, and it's rotating it around the world Z. I hit Z again, and now it's rotating around the Z of the original object. And that's really all you need to know going into this. Everything else we will learn as we go.